Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> okay. I'm very, very pleased to be here, uh, Leon, our host, and also the DVC who was here, and uh, meeting my colleagues from Africa. It's interesting that we meet in the UK and we have not been able to meet uh, in Africa. Uh, and I'm very, very happy and privileged to be able to give uh, this uh, presentation. I was asking myself before I came, why do I keep on saying yes when I'm asked to speak? Because I start thinking about what I'm expected to do after saying yes, Leon, but I'm glad to be here. Um, the topic on uh, interdisciplinary research in education, poverty, and development uh, is a topic that I have engaged with in the last uh, maybe two decades or so. And it's a topic that has helped me to grow to the kind of uh, researcher and educationist that I, am, that I am. And it's a journey that I thought I needed to bring within a presentation so that I can share what it has meant um, to me. So I'll be looking at reflections of partnerships in interdisciplinary research between South and South, between North and South, and East and South. And I think I have been very lucky to be engaged in that kind of different partnerships in interdisciplinary um, research. Now, there are two concepts that I thought about when I was asked to speak in this forum, the concept of interdisciplinary research, and then I have also come across multidisciplinary research. Now, I have been involved in uh, interdisciplinary research, and I thought that at one time I was involved in multidisciplinary research, but I didn't know until I had finished what I was doing and I had left. And I want to start with that one, which I later found that this is an engagement of people from distinctly different disciplines where you come in, give your package, I'm from education, give your package, and then when you finish, you walk away. I don't know how right I am, but when I looked at it, that's exactly what happened. Uh, this was an invitation to the School of Pure and applied sciences. And I am from the School of Education in the same university. I got this formal invitation to go and participate in a research training workshop of scientists. And I am from the School of Education. And the topic was endangered plant species. And I thought, oh my god, my work is to deal with endangered categories of children from early learning all the way to the university into the labor force. So I talked to the dean and said, I think you are mistaken. And he said, no, no, I'm not mistaken. This workshop, we are training our researchers on how to address the issue of those plant species that are endangered. I said, that's exactly why I think you are mistaken calling me. He said, no, who endangers those species of plants? I said, it must be human beings. How? Maybe looking for medicinal plants, leaves, herbs, and so on. He said, exactly that. We need you there to come and give a session so that we can see how we can work with you social scientists in this project and also from education because we want to have a component of education. So I went in there and I was very happy. I had a very good time working with these uh, researchers from Pure and Applied Sciences. But when that ended, my role ended. I was never invited again. I don't know what happened to those plant species or what they did with what I did. So I thought, aha. This must be it. I'm not very sure whether it's that. But then also, I have been involved uh, in interdisciplinary research, which I come to understand that we come together from our different 
backgrounds of disciplines and that we get engaged and work together in addressing an issue and contributing to solving or enhancing whatever we want to enhance all of us together by putting in the best from the disciplines we come from. So that's the one I'll be focusing on. I've also noted that we are addressing the SDG 1 on eradication of poverty by 2030, the SDG 4 on ensuring inclusive and equitable education and lifelong learning for all, and also SDG 5 on gender equality and empowerment of girls and women, which has been my area of specialization. Now, the number one SDG for me coming from the South, from Africa, from Kenya, is very, very important because I have always been asking myself, shall we be able at one time in my lifetime to eradicate poverty in my lifetime? And I say this because even when we go into communities where education is low, when we talk to young people who have low levels of education and coming from different backgrounds, they understand this global narrative. They know about $1.25 per person per day, which they say still this is too little to help us survive in one day when they look at how much they have to use in transport, how much they have to use in food, clothing, the dignity of remaining clean, good housing, they think is too small and they would ask me and I have no answer, how do you rationalize that $1.25 per day is the bare minimum that we are expected to survive on how do you calculate that? So it has remained an area of concern. And when we talk about interdisciplinary um, research and partnerships between North particularly and South, and the concept that in the North, which may not necessarily be true, there is no poverty. The poverty is in the South. We have both uh, hemispheres to come together understanding that there is a big query on that matter and there are huge expectations when the North comes to work in the South with the South on the issue of uh, poverty. The issue of education that is really, really has always been key over time ever since some of us were small, maybe before we were born, that education is the key. And I think it remains a major theme when we get together in an interdisciplinary manner to focus on inclusive, equitable education and education for lifelong learning. Because the expectation is that education, in the sense that majority of us have known to grow, has been interpreted as schooling. And therefore, when we talk about research in this area, we have to ask ourselves, are we looking at issues that address education as schooling? Or are we going beyond schooling to ensure that young people, older people, are getting knowledge and skills and they have the right attitude to engage in activities that bring in new knowledge, new skills that can transform their situation? Otherwise, there is this sustained uh, notion that when we talk about education, we are talking about schooling, and that schooling, the more the schooling you get, the less the poverty you find yourself in. Practically, that has been confirmed not to be true. And therefore, we have to be very, very careful conceptually the kind of research we engage in and how we can use that to address the right status of our people. Now, gender equality, which Leon has said has been my baby. I was a student of, where is my colleague in supervision of Madeline Arnott? Uh, he's very, I think you're still continuing. Yes, <laughs> that has been a major address uh, for me since those days. And um, I'm so glad that I was able to take up that kind of studentship because the issues of gender 
when you come to the south, and I believe even into the north, the issue of gender, the way we interpret it, the way we define it, and the way we practice it, when it comes to the practice, we have to be very, very, very aware of where we are, with whom we are engaging when we go back now to the practice. We can deal with the definition, that's fine, academic matters, but when it comes to the practice, the issue of cultures come in, and for us to be able to be seen to be serious, we need to understand the cultures of whatever peoples we are working with in a multidisciplinary uh, manner. So um, when I look at the whole uh, theme for this particular uh, workshop, I find that as universities, and I'm told there are maybe some NGOs whom I have worked with, universities are completely implicated in these three areas uh, of the SDG. They are implicated in interdisciplinary um, research and in partnership, because we cannot talk about interdisciplinary research and say you are working alone. It means that you have to get out and work with others in other disciplines as partners. So we are implicated there in doing research, disseminating the knowledge and giving service to communities. And that last part which I have put at the bottom is one of the major challenges when we talk of doing interdisciplinary research, focusing on selected thematic areas that we think are of interest to us as scholars and academics and the communities we work with because one of the mandates of universities is to be able to serve humanities and our energies must be seen to be to have transformed into that service and sometimes we just stop at the dissemination and we say this is the way things are this is how things are perceived we have even observed that this is how things are practiced and then we go away and what does that mean it is left with communities wondering what was the purpose of these people coming to actually waste our time and then just go away. And I'm saying this through practice. Every time I have had to introduce a project, I find a question mark, even if it's not spoken, but some, particularly the young people, they have told me, we have seen others. They come here, they talk to us about poverty. In fact, as we walk, just for familiarization, sometimes I have overheard somebody saying, well, these are those people who come to walk around here to see how the poor live. And I understand that slang language of, they don't think I, I, I'm following what they are saying. So they, because we are strangers, they say, who are these? These are the people who often walk around here to come and see how the poor live. So it is really, really important to know that as researchers coming from the universities, we pose big questions about what we go to do there. And it is our responsibility to come from that position of trying to help the other to understand us so that we can move in the same um, direction. So why research and why interdisciplinary um, research? I just want on that slide to look at my background. You know, I did philosophy of education at masters. Mm -hmm. And then I felt I was being pulled more to the sociology of education after my masters. And I remember my philosophy class where we were asking the question, we were asked what's knowledge? And then we would say is perpetuating, I don't know of what, instilling things and so on. And we were told by the philosopher Professor Benaz, that knowledge is justified through belief. It has to be verifiable. What we are doing must, and we are calling it knowledge, must be verified by others. And we have to ask ourselves as researchers what we do and the knowledge that we disseminate, who verifies and who validates that. And it is very important that the communities be involved in validating that kind of, if we are calling it knowledge from a philosophical perspective, it must be verifiable, but who is the verifier? Sometime we end up verifying and validating what we do, 
But from where that knowledge is generated, we don't provide the space for verification. And then in that class, I was told that knowledge has to be based on the truth. This is diff was a difficult one. And here we had all those theories. But importantly, when we do research, whatever we say is knowledge must be based on a truth that corresponds to the reality that we are, are studying. And only then shall it influence our belief or help us to actually challenge a belief that is not based on the truth and that uh, truth or anything we are calling truth that cannot be um, validated. So when I ask who validates the knowledge, then when we think about coming together from our different disciplines, we are saying that the researchers, the research communities, the government agencies that are involved must be included in that process of saying, yes, this is knowledge, it is useful to us, we can use it for our own purpose and for the purpose of the communities that we are working with. Now, I have used those uh, graphics. Definitely, those are maps, or they look like maps. Are they maps, or <laughs> they look like maps? Nobody now wants to talk, because we are talking about validation. <laughs> My dear teachers, and thank you for inviting me, do they look like maps or would you call them maps? They look like, look like now from a community that I did research some years ago, those are maps of their village and sub-village, right? So, um, our first entry to that community, of course, after the familiarization and explaining our projects, we started by actually mapping out the village, the households, mapping the household to know who lives here, who, with who, and so on, what are the educational levels. Now, the top map is the big sublocation, which had various five, actually, villages, which are named as you can see there. So these um, community members sat with us with Manila paper and they would say, yes, this sub-village is smaller than the next one. This one is actually longer than this one. And then eventually they would say, yes, this represents our sub-location. Now, if you take a geographer there, he will come out with something different but this was really meaningful to them. And I have picked out two sub-villages. There were five. One is Honeybee, and the other one is Getegi A. And of course, one of the things that um, made the communities move with us is because we were interested. What is this honey about? So they said the river down there on one side is Muiga River, and the other boundary is Honey, and this is where that village is. And so what is Getegi? And they said, oh, during those days of colonialism, we used to have a white man. So our, forefather, our fa grandfathers tell us he used to hunt birds. It comes from the word hunting. You know, go around and shoot down. And so there is Getegi and Getegi. They named one area. Uh, so we also learned some history which we don't find in our history books, which was very interesting. And they did a map that was meaningful to them. So I've just given an example of two of the sub-villages. And they would indicate this plot belongs to Fatuma. This belongs to Leon. And they would all agree and say yes for this sub-village. So I'm just trying to show how it is important to begin moving with the, with the, with the communities. So if we go down to the Google map, it may not give us exactly this. But for that community, that validated what we were doing. So now, come to another village, completely different. A sub-village from a world-famous area in Nairobi called Kibera. This is uh, an informal settlement, generally called a slum area. <coughs> 
end, in this particular research, we were supposed to map out the households, just like we did in the other one. And so uh, we went there and talked to the community and told them, here we are. We would want now to map out this place. And they said, ah, yes, we want to draw a map with you, together with you, identify households. And uh, they said, <laughs> draw a map of this place. We said, yes, we've done it elsewhere. And they said, the Kenya government has been here, walked around, <laughs> trying to develop, generate a map of this place. They never came up with a map. You think you can do it? Yeah, we've done it elsewhere. He said, they even came flying with aeroplanes trying to produce a map. And so we said, no, 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 we've got to do this. So we were given guides and we entered this place. The whole day, and I said, I have to be there because I don't want my colleagues to say they were unable. So I was there and we moved the whole day. You, we don't see the skies, you're just under there, moving around. And then I asked them, are we not going to leave this place? They said, no, we've moved very far. We've moved almost half a kilometer down because every house looked like the other. They are all conjoined. You cannot see the other side, but for me, everything looked the same. And we had drawn the zigzag things here, there, which made no sense. So we gave up. We said, okay. So after the Google Maps came, I still look and I do not see a map that can um, resemble the other one. So eventually, um, we had to find a way of describing this place. So we asked, okay, so where is this? They didn't have honey A or getegi B and so on. So it was by in relation to some landmarks. Oh, Karibu Namskiti, near the mosque near the SDA church, near the Maria Stops clinic, that is how they identify their places and we had to accept this. So we would say, okay, today we are going to the area near the mosque. So it made sense to them. And therefore, we had as researchers from North and South to come together and agree that this is how the community understands the mapping of their place. So what was important is get the household head, the members of the family, but forget the map the way we know it as having gone to school. So that's the place we were going round and round, trying to do a map. And eventually I would ask, why are we just going round the same house? I was told, no, we've moved like half a kilometer. So you can see why they were shocked when they heard that we are going to draw a map of that place. Now. Um, in this interdisciplinary research, which is in essence calling for partnership, um, my work over the two and a half decades or so in this kind of research um, has taught me that I am expected and we are all expected to be thinking beyond ourselves. And this is something that for us in the South learn to grow out of. We are very protective of our disciplines. Um, some years when I was a Dean of Education, I worked to try and develop programs with the School of Engineering. And I was trying to convince them that the School of Engineering should participate in the School of Education to train and educate teachers who can teach engineering subjects in the secondary school from our understanding of pedagogy. And they would say, no, 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 engineering is for engineers. So the dean before me failed. When I became a dean, the vice chancellor said, we have to do this, Fatuma. I said, but it's stalled. She told me, we had a lady vice chancellor, she said, I have also taken up stalled infrastructure and I am pushing them on. So it took me another two years for the other dean of engineering to end his term and a new one came. So I told him now, look, we got to do this. So together we managed to come out with at least four uh, programs that are not 
geared towards a master of science in engineering, but a bachelor of education in technical and vocational education, focusing on components of engineering that can make teachers. So we are just saying that we have to be ready and willing and to persuade others to think beyond um, their disciplines. Importantly also, we have to be open to indigenous and cultural knowledge. Because coming from our backgrounds, we have a kind of uh, parameters within what we call knowledge. And we forget that when we are doing community research, when we are doing social science research, research in education, in gender, we are finding communities that have survived generations with the knowledge that is indigenous and that has helped their communities to work. And it's a question of persuading each other about what is relevant to the topics that we are um, studying. Now, I would like to share with you specific examples of the kind of research that I'm talking about and how I interpret this particular topic. So we will look at that. And uh, so we start, and I would want to share this, which was cited um, in the late 1960s by Pearson. And he says, unless as interdisciplinary researchers, unless we carefully limit and institutionalize the relationships that we forge then there is potential to create opportunities for friction, for misunderstanding, wasting energies and resources, and creating mutual irritation. So the North will be irritated that the South does not seem to see the conceptualization, the essence, the value of what they have brought on the table. And the South will be equally irritated why do they think that they know what we have always known all the time? We've seen others before them who come and go and they leave us in our situation. And I want to give an example. When I was a student in Cambridge, I had friends in uh, University of Reading. And I remember at one point we were busy as students of Africa looking for one of the PhD students from Reading. She had come from Africa, from her country in Malawi with her data. And all of us know that doing and writing a PhD is not a walk in the park. And even my students, when they tell me, oh, the life is easy, I know I have to follow them closely to establish what they're doing. So this girl comes, she has her research, she writes her first draft. And like many of us, it's trashed. The second time she went, so I understand that the third time she told her supervisor, I am the one who went to Malawi. I know, I know my people. I know, it seems you know more than me and she threw the papers to her and then she vanished. <laughs> so we had a tough time looking for this girl. Eventually she was found. And when she went back, I understand the supervisor calmed her down and eventually she wrote her thesis and was happy with herself and her supervisor. The other one was from Greek, Greece. He was my classmate, so I find him sitting outside Great St. Mary's. I cycled past and I thought, that's Panos. So I went back. I said, Panos, it's six o'clock, it's getting dark. What are you doing at the doorsteps of Great St. Mary's? He said, Fatma, I have messed with my PhD. I said, why? He said, I told my supervisor that I don't think he is supervising me properly. I said, Panos, how can you do that? He was doing classics. We didn't have anyone in the School of Education to support him in classics, so he was being supervised in another school. So I told him, you just go back tomorrow to your supervisor, tell him you had lost your mind and you <laughs> highly regret. <laughs> and he said, do you think he'll believe me? I told him, you will come and tell me. Just go there and tell him, please, sir. Yesterday, I think I had lost my mind. You are the only one who can supervise me, so please. For and it worked. So <laughs> when we finished our PhD, Panos was left there with his classic supervisor and doing postdoc. 
very happy. He didn't go back to Greece um, uh, immediately. So this is a relationship that we have to think about. We are coming from different worlds, and therefore we have to look at this potential of misunderstanding, of irritating each other. All the time we have to consciously know that we are coming from different backgrounds and we need to have a common understanding with a common purpose that, will, that spells value, not just for one party, but also for the other party and other parties um, involved. So I found that um, um, this quote very, very important and the guidelines that are given in those bullets, very, very useful in terms of consultation, in terms of clear communication, in terms of expounding what we mean in our context and putting that meaning there to be interrogated and be agreed um, upon. Otherwise, we would be still going back to this donor thing about where the money is coming from, who is calling the shots, and what do these shots mean to whoever is calling the shots and whoever is on the receiving end of the shots. We do not want to get there. Some of us have seen how this can be improved and we believe we can only get better. All right, so we are saying we don't want to remain in that unidirectional um, relationship. It is so important that we forge interactions, meaningful interactions and dialogue that can get us to where we want to be. Importantly also what I have learned in this process is the value of mentorship. Not assuming that we all have PhDs in research areas and therefore we are moving from the same platform. It is so important that we mentor each other. We mentor each other in relationship, in relationship to the communities where we live in relationship to where the other partner is coming from. Everyone, I believe, requires a mentorship on things that they do not uh, understand entirely. And it is not possible that we can understand universally. It's not possible. And therefore, we have to be open into mentorship um, uh, in terms of conceptualizing the, the problem in terms of agreeing on the purpose of the research, in terms of the process of implementation, and in terms of what would be the challenges, and in terms of what would be the value. I will say that in my earlier years, my experience was that all this was coming from the North, because we have a history of working North-South. And my experiences as a young researcher, my job, and I worked in many projects, was to wait to be told this is the research problem. This is the way, the methodology. Then I was trained, this is what you do. And then this is how you draft alongside that. And after that, I said, phew, I'm free. I've finished and the people will go. And I'm left now with my community asking me, where did those people go, you know? So, um, we are looking now at this growing of mentorship and I experienced it more, I think, when I was now aware of what I can do, what I cannot do, what I need to do, what I do not need to do at the turn of this century when somehow I got catapulted, and I use that word, into research leadership where partnership now was broad and I was told everything depends on you. And I was, wow. And thank you to UNICEF, UNICEF Regional Office, the Eastern and Southern Africa region. That is immediately after my PhD. I'm not very sure whether it was because it was from Cambridge in the UK or it's because I was studying, specializing in gender. And I think gender and sexuality played a big role. So I was told there is this position for a researcher in this place and I went and I got the job which I did for several years. And this was the first time as a researcher, I was given a leadership role to manage South-South partnerships. And we were focusing on the whole issue 
of HIV and AIDS. That was the topic. What is the role of gender in either perpetuating or eradicating or bringing a decline to this scourge? What is the role of sexuality? What is the connection between gender and sexuality as far as HIV AIDS was concerned in the Southern and Eastern Africa region? And how can education actually come in? Now, this was a time where when we had been advised in the area of education to advise teachers to be integrating HIV AIDS education into their lessons. Nobody taught them how. So that was a major thing. And this research that we did in the countries just revealed how incapacitated the teachers were and what needed to be done. And one of the major questions that came out was, can every teacher actually be given the responsibility to integrate? Or are there certain teachers who have a passion and who are willing and have the skills and can be capacitated to do this? So th that's a huge study which we can talk for a long time, but I don't want to go into it because every, each of the seven countries, there were experiences. In some, like I remember one country, I don't want to name where we were told you cannot ask the kind of questions you are, you are putting on your tool on this kind of young children because they don't know. We don't want you to start implanting ideas into innocent minds. In the end, we were told you can go to secondary schools, but not this early. In others, we, went, we were allowed to go to, to lower classes. Now, these were some of the products of that research. Every country was uh, pu uh, produced a publication of what came from their country. And as a researcher, and I had a core researcher from South Africa, there was no person from the North, from South Africa, we helped them to contextualize the findings and recommendations from their own studies. And overall, for the region, for the Eastern and Southern Africa region, we also produced one comprehensive uh, publication, which is online, on uh, finding our voices, gender and sexual identities, uh, and HIV AIDS in education. Now, one important component of this South-South um, partnership was the, um, the, the ability to work with young people between 18 and 25 as part of the research team, which meant we training, we had to train them on interviewing and um, focus group discussion. And one of the things that struck us is that when you give young people the confidence of doing what they do every day, talking with their peers in groups or in individuals, you get another nuance of the data that as an adult researcher, they will tell me. As an adult female researcher asking them about sexuality, they will never tell me. Sometimes I would go to the field and they would ask about a colleague of mine, a younger colleague, Dr. Nderito, young man. They ask, where is Dr. Nderito? So I knew whatever we do after that, there is something specifically for Dr. Nderito. So partnership across the hemisphere, within the hemisphere, across different uh, uh, categories of researchers, old, young, female, male, they all work together to enhance um, that partnership. So that is the uh, South, South, East, South. Around the same time, from now, like 2004, 2005, I got involved in another one. And all this brings dynamics that we wouldn't find if we stick to one. This East-South was born out of a relationship between African universities and a university in the East, namely Hiroshima University in Japan, where we had exchange programs of professors. It was a professorship, visiting professorship program. 
And together we started talking about how we can go beyond this visiting professor. And the thing that made a lot of sense to us is to start a research partnership from the four African and one Asian university with three identified themes, gender inclusiveness, which I was the leader, education quality, and teacher development were the three themes. And we agreed we need to expand this. And as we speak today, this is now a unitwin network of 16 African universities and 12 Asian universities, including India, Taiwan, Singapore, what, even Ethiopia. Where is my friend from Ethiopia? <laughs> yes, yeah, we are there. In fact, from Ethiopia, we have two universities. Bahidar is one of them, and I have been to Bahidar. So, this one now was a new experience, east, south, and the difference was that in this one, culture is embedded. So studying there or having an exchange, the Japanese will make sure that you are visiting the homes. Getting, I have a small Japanese language book. And when they come, try and do the same. We take them to the Maasai, like one of them now told me her husband is being asked to pay 500 keto. When she went back to the Maasai land and told the, the Maasai host that she's now married, they said now, you bring your husband and he has to bring 500 kettle. <laughs> <laughs> so they came um, last month, February, and they passed through my office and I told the husband, what you do when you go there, tell them you, you start with one cow. By the time you finish 500 kettle, you will have died, your son, they came with their son, your son will pay, he will go, and they will go. That's the culture. You never take the 500 together, Leon. If you do that, they say, this is a bad man. He does not want relationship with the family to continue. He's taken our daughter, given us the cows, that's the end of the story. So I told him, don't worry. Go and say you want to start one cow. If they tell you one cow is 20,000, just say, uh-uh. That's too much. I can only afford 5,000. Then you negotiate and they say, okay, 3,000 is okay. I wish so, I <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this, this East South had brought in some other angle, the value of understanding and appreciating cultures of the partners and the communities in which you will be um, working. So there we are with the this uh, east south and then the north south the north south is the one that i had started with earlier on but around this time i saw something different even though the research problem and the conceptualization of how the structure of the whole research came from the north it was a bit different because the South researchers, we had responsibilities, which had not happened some 10 years before. We had responsibility of now concretizing the actual research activities. This is the broad research approach, qualitative approach, but we had responsibility now to start thinking how it's gonna work in the communities themselves, which I thought, wow, this is great. I had responsibility. I was accountable every quarter to show how it has worked. I had responsibility of managing the funds and made accountable. So this brought in something really fresh. And it came at a time when I had experienced South-South, I had experienced East-South, and therefore I had a bigger voice in talking about the things that can really work, the things we have to be cautious. So the ability to do that and to see that my voice is respected, except where, I don't know who I was sharing with yesterday, when we research poverty, because this was the, uh, the, the, the research on outcomes of education and poverty. When it comes to actually spending time with communities that have been identified in my country as pockets of poverty. And then we go and spend time, instead of him going to buy fish and sell fish, 
I'm sitting with him the whole day. Take me here, talk about this. What is he going to eat that night? So that bit I raised, I was raising it last night. And I raised it to our research director. I said, I can never live with that. I can never live with having removed people from their day to day earning of their bread. And then I just walk away. And therefore, I need a compensation. And I was told that is for you to worry about. We cannot put a budget here for compensation of that. So it was left to me again, but I was happy. I said, I'm going to deal with my own budget for that kind of compensation. And I tried even giving an example. When I was in this country, I would find researchers putting stickers, calling us to go and have a mosquito bite. For every bite, you get five pounds. So I was very tempted that, so, wow, I've lived in a country where I'm being beaten by mosquitoes all the time. 10 bites is 10 pounds, 20, 20 pounds for four bites. I'm going to list myself. I'll be compensated for them. Something told me, what if you get a strain of disease, which you will never know how to, so I removed my name. But even having gone to all that pain, my director for research said, Fatuma, no, 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 you decide what to do. And I decided, and I have been able to live with what I did. And this North-South um, Research Partnership, which had sociologists, anthropologists, economics of education, econo economics of education were there. We had people from Ghana, research NGOs, Pakistan and India were doing their own thing. In Kenya, we were doing our own thing. It's one of the ones that I have found to have a huge impact on communities. Communities that worked with us, we trained them on how to take digitalized data, store, retrieve, young people present the findings to their communities. It's one that has had great impact. In one area, they believed that they have been poor all those years because they didn't have secondary schooling. The schooling ended at primary. And they've been trying over the years, and today they do have a secondary school. They insisted, Fatuma Chege, we have asked the Ministry of Education to make you, to appoint you as a member of our school board. To be a member of a school board, you have to be a parent in that school. I have no children in school today, but there I am. But it makes me just feel good that even after the project ended, and the partners moved to do other things and we moved to do other things. There is something that reminds this community of our research that was meaningful to them. Some children were born in that five year period. One of them is called Recoup, a girl, under this research. You know? So you find in another community, they would talk behind our back and say, ah, this is one research where when they go, we are not left feeling wasted. You know, that is music to any researcher. When the community says they have not been left feeling wasted, meaning there are others that leave them feeling wasted. So those are the areas that um, we focused on. You can see there are issues of health, fertility, poverty, disability, and as researchers, to ask ourselves, what do we learn about this? I remember the sub-project on disability. I said, okay, you get us anyone who has a disability of any form, we are going to meet at this and this place. So one of my researchers told me, you cannot do that. I said, why? We have to go where they are. So now, for me, that was a learning experience. So we would go to different places to meet these people and engage them with our research. And one of them, young man who had a hearing impairment, said, I am, you know, it was being interpreted, I am always so glad when you come to this area because I have people to talk to. I had people who would interpret. So he would, he said, every time you come, I'm happy because there will be people who can talk uh, to me. So now, this is for us to think um, about advantages and disadvantages when we are engaged in this kind uh, of research. And one of the things I think I would want to highlight is the believability of what we are doing. How is it packaged to ensure that if it's coming from the North, the South believe in what is the purpose. The communities above all where this research is being done, 
believe in it. If you look at one of the um, photos on the on the right, on my right and on your on your left, this one here. These are young people who are downloading the data they have collected and then explaining it to their parents in that community. And I remember in this particular community, the parents, particularly the mothers, they were so excited saying, I never knew that my son knows these kinds of things. And we were telling them he's part and parcel of those who generated this knowledge. I didn't know that my daughter can speak like this in public. They felt so proud of their kids having been part and parcel of generating and sharing knowledge about their own um, community. This young man here was one of our guides in that maze of trying to draw the map. And he's one young man that we discovered. You know, you talk and you get bonded, and he was talking about his life. And he was about 24, living in the same room with his father, his mother, and other kids. But along the way, we realized that given an opportunity, he would make meaning in his life. And therefore, this is outside that partnership of North and South and the budgets that we were given but my team put that boy back to school and as we speak he has a degree in forestry now the problem comes in when others and there are many they hear that so they call they are sending messages even myself and so on and so forth so you are joined in the hip for the rest of your life and by that time leon you will have come back to Bristol, <laughs> but it's so worth it when we find communities are fulfilled about the meaning of why you went um, into the field. Now, some disadvantages, if you look at this uh, drawing at the bottom there, this was um, a study on children living in poverty and housing. The implication of that and schooling and what was coming out in this study where we were mainly looking at the kind of housing, the environment they live in and schooling, what came out now was beyond that because every encounter was about violence. We had asked them to talk about the safe spaces. I heard that this is a safe space here today. Now that issue of safe space kept on coming from, every, and these were children aged eight. So they were drawing, taking photos of, uh, the photo voice just talking about where they feel is safe or unsafe and what it means to schooling but violence which is another area of my interest kept on coming in now the challenge comes in what do you do as a researcher to make an intervention to be, uh, inform policy in a manner that can at least remove the violence removing this violence means removing those kids and their families from that environment so it's a huge huge challenge that is not usually part and parcel of the interdisciplinary research. You say this is the research, this is our finding, these are the briefs we have, and somebody else needs to take over. So there are um, challenges on that. Of course, the good things is the publications that we get, so that violence is there. The, the publication there also is on violence, what it means for girls when they travel in public means. These are challenges that we encounter in our research and we are left kind of feeling frustrated because we are not able now to move to the next step and say that we are providing a bus specifically for girls when they are going to school. Like that particular study, which was uh, some years back, the boys, we have this matatu kind of thing. He knows what I'm talking about. I think even in Ethiopia, we have those kinds of matatu minibuses, where for the boys, it is entertainment as they go to school, they will bring their music, it's put in the system, and they go feeling very good. By the time they reach school, they are happy kids. By the time the girls are reaching school, they are depressed kids because of what has happened. And the questions they ask, why were there adults in that minibus and nobody raised a hand? So when we get this kind of data, write briefs about it, how do we move from there? Because our journey tends to end there and somebody else needs to pick it up 
from there. So it's quite uh, frustrating and I want to stop there and thank you very much for listening to me.